Welcome to the Zero Trust Commandments section. My name is Mark Simos. I am co-chair of the Zero Trust Architecture um, Working Group uh, within the Open Group, and I'm also Cybersecurity Architect at Microsoft. So today we're going to be talking about where, what we're uh, doing uh, in, within the Open Group on the Zero Trust Commandments, and this is really part of a series of guidance. You know, first starting with Zero Trust Landscape, you know, which is an ongoing annual kind of survey and uh, information gathering and then providing publications on that once a year as well. And then the core principles, which really was that first stage of defining zero trust from an open group perspective and, you know, leveraging all of the knowledge and information and context from um, all the members and then laying out, you know, these are the principles, um, which we did map uh, quite closely to the original zero trust commandments, which has uh, influenced our, our current work uh, that we're working on here. We're working several of these in parallel. But we'll be talking today about the Zero Trust Commandments and uh, very much in the spirit of the original Jericho Form Commandments, um, but updated for the modern day and the, the cloud technologies and the current kind of challenges that we're seeing today in, in, the, in the real world or in today's world, rather. And then there's also work going on around Zero Trust Reference Architectures, uh, Zero Trust Business Guide and Practitioner's Guide um, that will also help make this real and make it much more actionable as well. So the zero trust commandments. Let's uh, uh, let's talk, walk through those, and we're going to be starting with the purpose of them and kind of why we're doing it. Then we'll talk a little bit about the assumptions these uh, commandments are really uh, brought under, and then we'll list uh, each of the commandments and kind of talk through each one and and you know the current state. This is uh, in draft, so you know again part of the call to action is for you all to participate. So if you feel really passionate, um, we'd love to have you involved and in kind of influencing and bringing your perspective to it. But the, uh, the list as it stands today is uh, the next piece that we'll cover. And then we'll zoom into one of the examples, uh, the first uh, commandment, and kind of how we're structuring those and why we're, we're, why we're thinking about it that way to help them become as clear as possible um, for guidance. This is, we found this particularly important to have um, these, these commandments and this clarity because, of, because zero trust is, is very popular. It's something that we're seeing a lot of uptake on, we're seeing a lot of um, interest and adoption of. But there's not a lot of clarity. There's a lot of different perspectives. So we really wanted to drive um, clarity and actionability, so organizations could take advantage of of, of the the modern approaches to security that zero trust brings uh, as quickly as possible without having to kind of work out a lot of conclusions on their own. So really shooting for that clear guidance, and then of course the call to action um, at the end to to have you all get involved and you know review read or um or join uh some of the different forms and working groups so the purpose of these commandments as i as i alluded to earlier is you know the overall purpose is we want organizations to become more resilient to these cyber attacks that we're seeing ransomware is something that is you know essentially built a business model a very uh sophisticated straightforward but sophisticated business model on extortion that is um, starting to take advantage of a lot of the security weaknesses that most of us in the security industry have been aware of for, for quite some time, it's now really becoming real as you know, these extortion-based attacks you know, make it real. And so there's an urgency to this that hasn't been there before. That's sort of the underlying theme. But um, what, what the purpose is really here is to get organizations resilient by giving clear guidance. And that's really what these commandments are designed for, is you know, we wanna make sure that there's a full life cycle approach, which is actually one of the commandments, but ultimately, we want to prevent as many attacks of these as we can. Of course, you can't prevent everything. There's no such thing as perfect. Um, we want to limit the impact and the likelihood of the attacks that we do have, uh, both ahead of time and in real time as they're happening. We want to rapidly recover from attacks because ultimately, you know, the business has to keep going. The organization's mission has to keep going, regardless of where the computer system state is at or the computer data is. And so it's really about making sure you're getting back to full operations as soon as possible. And then, of course, learning lessons. Because um, these attackers will try the same thing over again. They will try something that worked at a different target or a different organization. So it's really important to have that full life cycle view. So the benefits of following these commandments is, is really to, to get rid of that ambiguity, to really allow organizations to focus on what's important and what to start from and you know, where to start and what to do first. And you know, they're really intended and, and driven towards accelerating that ability to adopt zero trust and unblock, unblock um, the, the business value that uh, oftentimes security is holding up 
you know, using those uh, classic pre zero trust techniques. And then it also helps the, uh, to track progress in the long journey, you know, because, you know, this is a transformation when you talk about zero trust, much like um, it's a transformation, much like digital transformation, much like a cloud transformation. It's, it's really moving to a dynamic state of security where you're constantly trying to improve, but you're also dealing with uh, constant changes from the external environment. And so by being able to look and say, these are the clear things that we are going after, how well are we doing on number one, number seven, number two, number four? You know, how is that something we broadly applied well? And so it really kind of helps uh, with that. And of course, we're working to uh, build metrics that also uh, allow you to be much more uh, quantitative on that. And then uh, <laughs> this sounds a little funny coming from me from my other role that I'm also a uh, working for a company that does uh, is a security vendor. But ultimately, one of the things that we've seen that's actually harming a, a lot of organizations is really trying to sort through all the different vendor claims, zero trust this, zero trust that. And it's really, really confusing and difficult for organizations to understand, okay, so how does this fit in? What does this help with? And so we expect that these commandments will also help rationalize the vendor claim. It's like, okay, you say this is helping, but in what way? Which which zero trust commandment does this actually help me achieve? And how does it do it? And so really it kind of helps setting up that North Star. So the assumptions here, we, we were realizing as we were going through it and defining these commandments that and, and the core principles themselves as well, because the commandments are in, in, in effect a, a maturation or a, um, an, a, a, an evolution of the, of the original core principles to be very specific, very actionable. And we realized that there was a couple of underlying assumptions that we wanted to call out here. And we you know, put a little yin yang in there because it kind of illustrates the sort of interesting duality of security. First of all, we have to assume failure. And sometimes you see this as assume breach or assume compromise. Uh, Microsoft principles call out assume breach. I believe the uh, NSA zero trust principles also call them out and a few others. Uh, breach tends to mean a, 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 a um, has a very specific legal meaning in a lot of different jurisdictions. So we tend to say assume compromise more now, but that, that assumption of failure is really the underlying piece. You're gonna assume that the attackers are gonna be successful sometimes. You have to assume that your people are going to make mistakes sometimes. We've all clicked on a phishing email, uh, et cetera. So it's really important to have that assumption that things will go wrong built in. And this has you know, been recognized for a long time in the engineering space through sort of the fail safe design principle that it should, the, the system should will may fail some or will fail eventually, and it has to fail in a safe state. And then there's another side to it as well that we don't see a lot of, uh, of traction on that we want to make sure is there for completeness which is assumed success, you know, despite, you know, the, the darkest night and all the things that could go wrong, things will go back again. We've seen this with some of the worst case scenarios that hit various different organizations with ransomware and not patch and, and some of the other high profile attacks and, and others that didn't get reported or weren't widely known publicly that, you know, life goes on, business goes on. And it's really important to sort of have that assumption in there as well, that you're there to enable the business and even, after the security attack, you know, it's, it's there to uh, enable the business afterwards and to get back to that as quickly as possible. So we found this duality is really important to, to call out and highlight. So the commandments themselves, right now, the way that they're drafted is we've, we've really broken down to four categories. This is, if I recall correctly, a slight simplification of how they uh, were represented in the core principles. The first one, which we'll, we'll cover in detail, is really about modern work enablement. And that, that ties into that assume success uh, uh, underlying assumption that ultimately you know, security isn't there to make something secure. It's made it's there to enable an organization, right? The way that it enables the organization is keep it secure against attackers. But ultimately, security isn't the goal. Security doesn't create value. The actual business and the mission uh, completion, you know, whether it's an NGO government or a for-profit company, Ultimately, the, 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 that mission, that business has to succeed and security just helps them do it safely. And so it's really important to have that as that very first beginning one with the um, immediate follow ons of aligning to the organizational goals and the risk management framework and the way that the risk is uh, managed within the organization. So that's really the, the key parts of that first piece is to really set that North Star of you know, the purpose of security. The next section there, the guardrails and governance. Um, is really about, um, you know, kind of setting, you know, governance. Sometimes people like the term, sometimes people don't like the term, 
Um, so we put guardrails in there as, as a way to sort of make it clear to everyone that ultimately this is really how you keep things on track. And so the first part is people guidance and inspiration. You got, everybody's got to be on the same page. Well, you need a page that architecture policy standards that, that help everybody understand within the security organization and, and, and elsewhere within the organization on how to work together. That risk and complexity re reduction, you know, keeping it as simple as possible. Alignment and automation, keeping all the different pieces parts working together instead of operating in silos. Security for the full life cycle. Oftentimes we see blind spots in, in security where people are worried only about we're going to secure this session. Well, what about the server or the client on either side of it? So it's really important to have that sort of full life cycle view. And we see that applied in a lot of different ways um, where there's sort of just a, a narrow, particular specialized focus. The technology piece, this is um, a very, very important uh, shift in the, the technology or the way that uh, technology folks think who have been very, very technology centric for their security as opposed to asset centric. It's really important to define what is valuable to the business. What are the assets that need to be protected or that are being developed that need to be safe as they're incubated? And then translate those into technology and protect it as opposed to saying we're going to keep this network safe. You know, with a, with a technology centric view that's really blind to the business value of any asset on it. So it's really important to make that very subtle, but very important shift to asset centric security, focusing on the data, focusing on the applications that create value, the data that stores value. Commandment nine is least privilege. And so this is a, a key principle that, you know, it's, it can be as simple as don't have any more admins with control of everything than you need to. But it also uh, goes into the, the world of you know, just in time privilege. So limiting uh, privilege by time, because the more privilege someone has, the more time that they have that, you know, that creates a, essentially an attack surface and a risk to the organization. I like to think of it as, you know, a lot of people treat admin accounts like, ooh, I want that, like it's a, a little gold nugget. But in fact, it's actually more of like a, a nugget of plutonium that brings its own danger that you don't necessarily want that power. You want to reduce that as much as possible so you can reduce the potential damage. You know, again, without assumed failure, assumed breach in case something goes wrong. And the last piece um, is really around that security controls. So with 10 there, the simple and pervasive, again, that similar theme from that simplicity that reducing the complexity. But, you know, the key is, is that these security controls should be really hidden, right? They should just be a part of the background. They should be a part of the fabric. People don't think about them. They don't have to have any more friction on it than they than they have to. For example, going to the cloud in Azure, AWS, or what have you, when a developer creates an environment, the security should be just built in, right? They shouldn't have to worry about it. They shouldn't have to think about it. They shouldn't have all those points of work. So it's really important when those security controls are built is you want to be simple as possible, you know, as invisible as possible, and also just pervasive. And this is just the way things work. This is the background. This is not the actual main characters. So that's a very important piece. And then the commandment 11 there, the explicit trust validation. You know, ultimately we had, you know, without really intending to, I think it, was, it wasn't a design goal when we had a perimeter centric approach. You know, we essentially assumed that anything on that network was trustworthy as long as it had a physical connection to that network or a Wi-Fi connection to that network, we're going to trust it more. And that's no longer a, a, a reliable assumption. So we have to explicitly validate trust. We have to bring as much data sources and as much input and as much telemetry that helps us essentially filter the poison out of the water. So, you know, we want to have the legitimate stuff just be simple and work and, and you know, legitimate user email productivity application access. But we want to take the impersonators. We want to take the malware. We want to take all of the bad stuff out of it. And the way we do that is we have to have as much telemetry and data to figure out what is normal versus what is anomalous and then the gray areas in between that need a human to check it out. But, you know, that explicit trust validation really relies on having those uh, data sources and then actually using that to, to filter out like, hey, this is an impersonator for sure. This is an attacker that's stolen a credential. No, um, this is something that's in the gray area. Let's send it over to security operations and have them investigate it, et cetera. But that explicit trust validation rather than just saying, oh, they're on the network, so they're fine. Yeah, so we got to get out of that mode as well. So let's dive into an example here real quick. So this is a quick summary, and I'll show you a screenshot of the current draft in a moment. But um, commandment one, modern work enablement, we've got a what, why, and a how for each. And we know as different cultures, you know, sort of center on, you know, the why and the theory behind it in order to really sort of understand and appreciate and agree with something. We know some other cultures tend to value the how and the details. Show me how it works, and then I'll believe it's a good idea. 
So we really wanted to have all of that to make sure it was as clear as possible across um, as many organizations and cultures as possible. So, you know, what very simple, straightforward one, maybe two sentences, you know, people must be able to work on any network in any location with appropriate security assurance and asset access restrictions. Very clear, very straightforward. The why explains why and why this would be different than anything you may expect or anything that had come before. So really providing that reasoning behind it. And then the how, and this is obviously a shorter version of each of those. We'll show you the screenshot in just a moment, but ultimately showing how this works and how do you apply this? You know, it sounds like a great idea, but what do I change? What documents do I affect? What uh, technology do I reconfigure in a different way? So we really wanna lay that out there with uh, some examples and, and, and such to help people with it. Again, these are uh, commandments, so they're gonna be broadly applied in a lot of different circumstances, but we wanted to make sure that we had a really clear center to start from. And then this is uh, kind of long form. We're trying to keep these around a half a page to a page, so they're easy to read, but they still have a couple of really good, clear examples. Any caveats are noted, and there's, you know, so the why has a couple extra sub bullets that we did cover in the previous slide, and the how does as well. So really trying to make this as clear as possible in the least amount of reading, because we don't want to, we don't want to put out a 20 or 30 or 50 page document that nobody reads. So really meant to, to mimic the original Jericho commandments and, and the successes of that. And so with that, the call to action here, we'd love to have you involved more in the security forum in the, in the Zero Trust Architecture Working Group. So um, if you're interested in that and you've got the time and cycles and experience to contribute, we'd love to have you there. The, the Core Principles White Paper itself is available. So there's a link for that there. Um, there's a LinkedIn Working Group. Uh, a LinkedIn for the Zero Trust Architecture Working Group that you can join. And uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact our Security Forum Director, John Linford. And with that, I thank you very much. These uh, have, this has been an introduction to the Zero Trust Commandments. Thank you.